Australia was a new nation. She was forging an identity. They sign the bottom line and they're gone with, within a month. About half of them are either mangled by the war or killed. That has an enormous impact on their families. And I think it's important to realise it has a big community effect. When you come to the war, they start to recruit. Wodonga, like the rest of the place, has had recruiting bands and recruiting procedures. I mean, everyone liked the idea of getting people to go to war. Wodonga, during the war, it was less than 2,000 people. So as soon as somebody enlisted and went off overseas, you knew who had gone. But at this stage, Wodonga's a rural service town. People are on the land and they're raising cattle or sheep or growing wheat or growing grapes. Those that had sheep and those that were raising bullocks had a good war. The price of wool went up double, the price of bullocks and lambs went up double. So Wodonga had a good war in that it prospered economically by the war. The railway became more important because it was taking the wheat to market. So the railway towns, Wodonga and, and Wangaratta, were beginning to take off. Wodonga would have had very few cars. It was still horse and buggy. No sealed roads. The roads were, were dirt roads. There was one store, but Schlink was one of the, the quite early ones. Albert Schlink um, arrived in South Australia in 1854. He um, decided that he would come to Wodonga and try his luck and uh, he started growing grapes. Phylloxera took their vines and they moved into town, into Wodonga. And in the 1870s, they set up Schlink's store. They had eight children. Many of them did well. Herbert Schlink in particular did particularly well. He went on to become a Macquarie Street specialist. Prior to World War I, he was already in uniform in the citizens' military forces. And as soon as war broke out, um, he was the commandant of the military camp and hospital at Liverpool in, outside of Sydney. Questions were asked in Parliament um, soon after the outbreak of the war. Why is there a German man looking after our troops in Liverpool. Within a few days, um, Herbert felt he could do nothing but resign from that position, despite the fact that his name had been cleared because somebody had got up in Parliament and explained that this man had been born in Australia, his parents had been here for 50 years at the time, had been naturalised before the children were born, and Herbert could speak or read no German. In the meantime, his brother Clem, who was in Germany, he was interred in a prisoner of war camp because he was an Australian. There were big German settlements at Barranduda and Kiwa and Tangampalangpa. And, and the families from there, they must have had a terrible war. The war didn't cause cohesion as much as, as, as problems that were a long, long time there. The Australia they're fighting for was very much a divided Australia, and it divided along these lines of religion and political affiliations and ethnicity. Uncle Harry left Gippsland, which is Gunai Nation, to go fight in the war. Uh, he did not return, so that left his widow with children. Harry decided to enlist and his wife and children were then sent to the reserve. When his uh, widow wanted to actually um, receive some widow's assistance, she was told that you're being looked after by the reserve. Yeah, he, he had just been decorated as a war hero and yet she wasn't considered the widow of a war hero. When they they went, it was to to fight for the country, to be recognised as a person, and come back 
with honour and recognise because before they went, they were nothing. So I think it was a way um, to be part of the wider Australian and be accepted. But when they come back, they're still segregated. Not allowed in the same picture theatre, shops or anything. So he, he could fight over there besides his white Australian brothers and do everything he could there. But when he come back, um, it was segregation again. The army had no patience with black or white. Here's your job. You're a private or you're a corporal or a sergeant. You did it no matter what your colour. When they recruited, up in the northeast, I think they recruited something like three and a half thousand people. Average age, 24. And nearly all single. And of those, we know that 20% get killed. Albert George Stapleton was actually born in Ireland. He went to school in Melbourne and uh, eventually on graduation from high school he went off to Queen's College to study to be a Methodist minister. He eventually was sent by the Methodist Conference to Wodonga to be the circuit minister here in Wodonga. By August 1914 war has broken out and literally within days, in fact the 24th of August to be precise, Stapleton is back in Melbourne in the uh, recruitment office enlisting to be a soldier. Now that's an interesting thing for a clergyman to enlist as a soldier. He gives his occupation or profession as it says here uh, as a student. He may have been advised to write that because if he'd written that he was a Methodist clergyman they may not have taken him because the Brits capped how many chaplains we could have in Australian uniform. His registered number is uh, 146, so he was very early in enlisting and uh, obviously very keen to go. Uh, he did his training and eventually uh, sailed for Gallipoli. He fell on the 25th of April 1915 at uh, Anzac Cove, or what's now Anzac Cove, at Gallipoli. So he was killed during the Gallipoli landings. The High Command ordered that no chaplains were to land during the landings. Now, the Catholic one, Fay, um, got to land. In his diary, he, was, he said, basically, I'm running around the beach, you know, delivering last rites to, to every man I see um, that's falling because it's just so horrendous. So I don't know how long before uh, Stapleton was killed, but um, certainly he may well have been one of the one of the few that were there to support spiritually those soldiers who were landing on that beach. The other thing that I was able to unearth about Stapleton was um, some of the anguish that families faced uh, in, in that time, particularly when they lost a son or, or a husband or a loved one. And uh, in his war record, in the archive war record, there's a whole bunch of letters uh, that, that go right up to about 1923 of his mother writing to various members of parliament, uh, various government officials, trying to secure what belongings um, Albert George may have had. You can sort of see in the letters when you read the, uh, the correspondence, there is a certain grief that she's dealing with. It's very evident in the words, but also even in between the lines. I think the community's bonded but in their grief, particularly when, you know, the uh, telegram boy would deliver the the telegram and of course it was also the soldiers coming back, the wounded coming back, men with limbs missing and blinded by, by some of the weaponry that for the first time the world had seen. That was the first time we'd quite managed to, to have machines of war that, that dealt out mass destruction. They landed in December 1915 in the Middle East, then they sailed to uh, for Marseille and they landed in Marseille in March 1916. The gun pit was, was wiped out. Some of them were killed immediately and Dad, they found him in a, in a mud hole and that was all that was showing. And they don't know how long he was in there and of course he affected his kidney. So he spent four months in England and then they sent him home and discharged him. They said, you've got 10 years, we'll give you 10 years. And the day he, he went into hospital on the, and he said to mum, I said, he's going to the hospital. Well, my 10 years are up today, uh, up this week. And he, he died that, during that week. 
I was only nine months old. I didn't, I didn't know him at all. So everything I knew that was only what Mum told me. She was on a war, war widow's pension, and we were lucky because we had a uh, mum had a brother. He lived out in Wollumbundry, out in the bush, and he used to be send in a, a leg of lamb or something. And uh, we occasionally used to get the eggs and, and you know and, uh, chook every now and again. That's how we survived, sort of business. Some of the families were scratching, you know, and the widows would go round all the friends and, and see if they can get clothing and things like that. Apart from the trauma on the people, which was dreadful, there's now all these women of which there's no young men counterparts. This is my story of World War I memories. To start off my story, I would like to tell you something about my mother, Belle Shepherd, Nee Coleman. Belle was born at Bona in 1913. When just three years old, Belle had an incredible memory, stood beside her great aunt, Bessie Bradford, watching as she waved goodbye to her fiance, who was leaving for World War I. Before he left, he leaned over and patted Belle on the head and said, will you look after Bessie in case I never come back? as he and many like him of that time, he did not return. Bessie was a nurse in the local district and never married after losing the love of her life. Bessie passed away in the ni in 1960s after being looked after and living with Belle's family all her life. Bessie's engagement ring was inherited by myself as I used to do things for Bessie when I was young. When my daughter Sarah, who is sitting here with me, was to become engaged to Matthew McBean, I offered them Bessie's engagement ring. The ring is now 100 years old and is very cherished by its new owner. It would be absolutely dreadful to see all these men going off to fight a war. You didn't know where they were going, you didn't know what they were going into. And you'd be waiting for the telegram to come every day. But the the country still had to go on. The men weren't here to run it. A lot of women went and worked in factories to keep the country going because the men had all gone off to war. The conventional bet is that the women were left to, to, to weep and wait. But women didn't just weep and wait. Uh, they got very active in the conscription campaign and there were just as many in the anti-conscription campaign. They were active in the money raising and they were active in the Red Cross. There was a great deal of enthusiasm of the way we can support the boys at the front was to knit socks and send off balaclavas, but also to raise money for comforts funds. And one of the things, they had euchre and dance nights and they had oodles of them and people were invited to come along and spend their money in support of the boys. And the kids, the kids were um, very busy collecting things. They collected wheat sacks, uh, they collected frogs, uh, they collected leeches, uh, they collected rabbit skins, and all of these there was a market for, and kids were good at collecting those kinds of things to raise money for the front. They just showed a community spirit you know, they had to rely on each other and mateship was a great thing. Oh yes, I think it definitely changed the world. At the very end of the war, people viewed their nation's history through terms of what did it mean to my village? And there was the name of my boy. Each of these, these people that are on that cenotaph at Wodonga, and indeed on any cenotaph around Australia, were people who helped shape a community and the sad and tragic thing about it is is that their opportunity to further shape that community was cut short. <laughs>